Okay, welcome everyone to part one of this workshop, which is going to be on Lawrence Hill's The Book of Negroes. And this first part is going to be considering uh, the space of the diaspora and how we might conceptualize that space. So I've called it conceptualizing the spatial diaspora. And it's gonna be a little bit complex in terms of the theory this workshop so do pause it and and spend more time with some of the uh textual examples i'm going to give if, if you need to that's that's fine i'm not going to go into too much analysis but each um kind of piece of text that i'm going to allude to you could definitely spend much longer um interpreting it okay so i'm going to start with a quotation from Toni Morrison, moving on from last week, and as we, as we, as you might know, Morrison's also written on slavery, uh, particularly in her novel *Beloved*. Um, this is um, Toni Morrison talking about slavery. So she says, "Modern life begins with slavery. From a woman's point of view, in terms of confronting the problems of where the world is now." Black women had to deal with the postmodern problems in the 19th century and earlier. These things had to be addressed by black people a long time ago. Certain kinds of disillusion, the loss of and the need to reconstruct certain kinds of stability, certain kinds of madness, deliberately going mad in order, as one of the characters says in the book, in order not to lose your mind. These strategies for survival made the truly modern person. They're a response to predatory Western phenomena. You can call it an ideology and an economy. What it is, is a pathology. Slavery broke the world in half. It broke it in every way. It broke Europe. I made them into something else. It made them slave masters. It made them crazy. You can't do that for hundreds of years and it not take a toll. They had to dehumanize not just the slaves, but themselves. They had to reconstruct everything in order to make the system appear true. It made everything in World War II possible. It made World War I necessary. Racism is the word that we use to encompass all this. So I wanted to begin with this Morrison quote because I think it captures something really interesting about this question of modernity. Um, that is a question that you could say um, is usually, um has usually been kind of a, a question that um white western imperialist nations have taken up what is modernity how do we understand the modern world um and here morrison is basically ascribing that sense of modernity to black people first of all who experience that um differing sense of identity and I'm gonna talk about some of the ways in which Morrison thinks about this, but also how in the novel, we could think about um, Aminata as a kind of modern woman in her experiences. So, um, as you might have noticed, the, the novel is a Canadian novel um Lawrence Hill a Canadian writer and it's a novel of um the diaspora or diaspora um and the word diaspora um comes from the idea of a scattered population whose origin lies in separate geographic locales um so historically the word was used to refer to the involuntary mass dispersion of a population from its indigenous territories so for example um if we think about um the dispersion of the jews in europe um in the kind of uh, early modern period particularly up into the modern period um so, but the word diaspora actually has quite an interesting etymology as well and, and kind of various definitions. It can mean um, a form of scattering. Um, it can mean a sense of a group migration or flight. And it can also mean that sense of involuntary dispersal. So involuntary dispersal here, you can think about slavery as being involuntary uh, removal of one population to another. 
So Canada has an interesting relationship with particularly um, the black diaspora, as we see in the novel. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today comes from Paul Gilroy, who's a black British uh, academic. And um, a lot of these ideas are taken from his um, seminal work from 1992, The Black Atlantic, Modernity and Double Consciousness. And I suppose this, I've included this extract, um, which you may have already read from this week, um, just to think about why this sense of understanding um, diaspora and understanding that sense of being scattered and not having a kind of specific rooted place is really important and as a kind of alternative way of thinking about um, black identity and so Paul Gilroy um, first explains the idea of kind of cultural nas nationalism or Afrocentrism and if we think back to people like Amiri Baraka he was interested in forms of kind of black cultural nationalism um, in some of his work but Paul Gilroy here is giving a kind of analysis of that and explaining why um, he believes that um, Afrocentrism um, or the Afrocentric movement um, is kind of limited. So he says, the Afrocentric movement appears to rely upon a linear idea of time that is enclosed at each end by the grand narrative of African advancement. Uh, this is momentarily interrupted by slavery and colonialism, which makes no substantial impact upon African tradition uh, or the capacity of black intellectuals to align themselves with it. The anteriority of African civilization to Western civilization is asserted not in order to escape this linear time, but in order to claim it and thus subordinate its narrative of civilization to a different set of political interests without um, even attempting to change the terms themselves. The logic and categories of racial metaphysics are undisturbed, but the relationship between the terms is inverted. Blacks become dominant by virtue of either biology or culture. Whites are allocated a subordinate role. The desperate manner in which this aversion proceeds betrays um, it as merely another symptom of white supremacy's continuing power. So I'll try and unpack this a little bit, but this is really talking about um, some of the notions of um, Africa as being um, pre-colonialism and pre-slavery, a kind of center of um, kind of advancement, human advancement in terms of culture, but also in terms of science. So if you think about, for example, um, if people watch the Black Panther film that came out a few years ago, the, the Marvel film, and its representation of um, of Wakanda as a place of this kind of imagined um, Afrocentric uh, centre of culture, but also of science, then what Paul Gilroy is saying is by kind of imagining and reconstructing this sense of, of Africa, um, of refinding Africa as if kind of um, slavery and colonialism had never happened. Um, what, what Gilroy is arguing is that this kind of fits in with the Western ideology of um, advancement and of development um, as a kind of linear process. Um, so you might invert the term, so you might say that Black Africans have been at the forefront of uh, kind of advancement in technology, but that that is in fact um, a Western ideal of how civilization should function. So becoming civilized means advancing. And so uh, as Paul Railway argues, that whole kind of narrative structure, that linear narrative of, of advancement of Africa is actually another symptom of white supremacy and particularly kind of white supremacist ideology and capitalism, you could also argue, which, which looks at um, an idea of linear advancement, moving progression, um, especially technologically, 
as being the kind of epitome of civilizing. <clears throat> so how do you work against those notions then if you agree with Gilroy? And so you have uh, figures like Edouard Glissant, um, who writes against the petrifying essentialist vision of Africa. Um, and he particularly writes about Caribbean identity and the idea of the Creolite, um, so Creole identity, which is always a form of kind of hybrid identity, which relies upon cultural and linguistic heterogeneity. Heterogeneity here just means kind of difference, masses of difference. Uh, homogeneous, you might know that word, that means sameness. So here he's looking at forms of difference that can be celebrated and understood as kind of um, overlapping and imbricated. So instead of looking at the kind of essentialist vision of Africa as something that was um, kind of longed for, but also in some ways kind of homogeneous, um, that you look at kind of Creole and Creolite forms of identity. And if you think about, for example, in, um, in the novel, um, the ways in which um, when um, Aminata is in the United States or in Canada and she's looking at maps of Africa, um, there's never a kind of accurate representation of what Africa is geographically or um, on the map, so the cartography of Africa. Instead, they put um, elephants and monkeys in its place. So um, there's always a, a sense in which that history of Africanness um, is coming through in a distorted way that you can't ever accurately recapture um, what it means to be African. Okay, <clears throat> so again, this is Glissant in his text, The po Poetics of Relation. And um, we're thinking now about a sense of identity and where you come from. So roots and the roots towards your identity. So uh, Glissant argues when identity is determined by a root, the emigrant is condemned, especially in the second generation, to being split and flattened. Usually an Usually an outcast in the place he has newly set anchor, he is forced into impossible attempts to reconcile his former and his present belonging. So if you think here about the idea um, of having your identity rooted in um, particularly a certain nationality, um, then as soon as you um, move beyond those national borders, so as soon as you are either taken from Africa or leave the Caribbean or leave Canada means you're um, condemned to a form of exile and that's deeply problematic. Um, so how do you challenge these these forms of kind of rooted identity I suppose? So let's go into a bit more detail about what root identity would mean. So root identity is founded in the distant past in a vision, a myth of a creation of the world. Um, it is sanctified by the hidden violence of affiliation that strictly follows from this founding episode. So again, we can think about this as a linear understanding of time. You begin in a place and that you have a kind of affiliation or affiliation with that particular place. Um, root identity is ratified by a claim to legitimacy that allows a community to proclaim its entitlement to the possession of a land, which thus, thus becomes a territory. So this is really important. So if you believe in root identity, then you believe that um, certain communities have an entitlement to that land, which becomes a territory and can then become a nation. So root identity is always um, related then to uh, entitlement and possession of particular land. So root identity then is also preserved by being projected onto other territories, making their conquest legitimate and through the project of a discursive knowledge. 
Um, so you know who you are because you're not from that other bit of land. Um, you have to create a sense of knowledge about your own um, kind of rootedness and history in that, in that land. So root identity therefore is rooted in the thought of self and of territory and set in motion the thought of the other and of voyage. So <clears throat> um, in contrast to the idea of the other and of voyage, you construct this sense of self and of territory that is much more deeply rooted. So that is some of the kind of main aspects of root identity. But as an alternative, we have the idea of relation or relational identity. So relational identity is linked not to a creation of the world, but to the conscious and contradictory experiences of contacts among cultures. Um, it is produced in the chaotic network of relation and not in the hidden violence of filiation. So relation, relationality, how you and your community might relate to other communities and cultures that are that, that come in, that you come into contact with. So relational identity does not devise any legitimacy as its guarantee of entitlement but circulates newly extended. So this question of legitimacy, of who has legitimacy being where and being in what loc location or locale um, isn't guaranteed, but there's a sense of circulation and extending outwards. So relation identity does not think of a land as a territory from which one project toward another territory, but as a place where one gives on and with rather than grasps. So um, again, this is getting into quite a lot of detail here, uh, but if we think about traditional ideas of territory, there's always a sense in which one territory is encroaching or engaging with another one. If we try and rethink that relation, um, the, the, the sort of, locations and territories gives on and with so there's a sense of exchange in that contact uh, contact rather than grasp so rather than a sense of like holistically trying to know that other group you're just kind of having an exchange with them um, so relation identity exalts the thought of errantry and of totality so there's a sense in which relational identity is kind of always um, unfinished. It's not, doesn't claim to know everything about itself and of its own kind of existence, uh, but there's a sense in which it can always um, continue and be kind of improvisational. Um, and I just want to show you these two images actually first, which we can think about relating to root identity and versus relational identity. So in the bottom here, you have a picture of a tree. And uh, the picture of the tree is a kind of representation of the sense of rooted identity. So we know that trees are rooted in place, that those um, the kind of linear movement of the tree moves from down at the bottom where the roots are, um, up the stem, um, up the trunk rather, and then up the branches and into the smaller kind of leaves. So there's a sense in which the tree is a representation of this linear form of identity or form of kind of rootedness. Um, and even though these roots kind of spread out, kind of tendril-like, there's a sense in which the, um, the movement, particularly of things like water and of minerals in a tree, are always flowing in a kind of linear direction. So they're flowing from down to up and they're feeding the leaves and vice versa. So um, the, the kind of <clears throat> movement within that tree system is always going to be linear 
and then so we can compare that directly with um, this image on the on the left which is a picture of what's called a rhizome and this can be understood as a kind of rhizomatic model um, which relates to the idea of the relational or relation identity as opposed to the root identity so as you can see here a rhizome moves in multiple directions at once it has no sense of a linear or kind of um, singular progressive uh, movement that all of these different um, kind of all of these different <clears throat> um, outreaching parts can, can kind of move in any direction and they're not moving in a kind of unilateral singular direction. They all relate to one another. Um, so there's a sense in which there's a relationality that's much more of a network of relations here. So each, as you can see here, these are kind of toadstools. So each um, area of the rhizome has a relationship that's kind of almost democratic, you could say, with every other area, as opposed to the, the root tree model, where you have a kind of singular relationship that's moving from one place to another. And so <clears throat> um, the rhizomatic model um, has been conceptualized by uh, Deleuze, uh, Deleuze and Guattari in their work, A Thousand Plateaus. And again, this is quite complex, but I'll, I'll read it out and try and um, unpack it for you. So they say the rhizome is an a-centered, non-hierarchical, non-signifying system without a general and without an organizing memory or central automaton. So it's a-centered, therefore it doesn't have a center. There's no central location to a rhizome. It's non-hierarchical, it doesn't have a hierarchy, there's no sense in which, for example, in a tree, the leaves might be seen as the top part, the roofs are the kind of, um, the roots of the bottom part, so there's a sense of a hierarchy in that root system. Um, <clears throat> it's without a general, which means it doesn't have anything that's commanding it. Um, and also is without an organizing memory, which is interesting. So there's no sense in which a rhizome is replicating um, or reproducing an idea of what it should look like. It kind of is very organic and it's constructing itself anew every time. And the second point that uh, Zalus and Katari talk about with a rhizome is that any point of a rhizome can be connected to anything other and must be. This is very different from the tree or root, which plots a point, fixes an order. So that sense of interconnectedness, uh, kind of non-hierarchical relationality, we would call that. And I think the, the best example of a rhizome um, in, kind of in the contemporary world really is the internet, right? So the internet is a network of relations um when you look for something on the internet you you know you, you kind of fall down into a, a hole of googling things and, and maybe looking at different resources um those ideas are, are functioning in a network um okay there's some sense of construction by google or whoever else but but the point is that the idea of the internet is that everything is connected to everything else in a kind of non-hierarchical form so <clears throat> i've talked a little bit about um epistemologies as well on this course um of kind of understanding how um particularly in black culture um we might understand forms of knowledge and forms of power and if we think about the tree, the tree is often used as an example of a form of epistemology. So um, 
for example, how do you learn about slavery? Okay, well, to learn about slavery, you have to understand the roots of slavery. You understand the main economic kind of um, kind of uh, trunk of slavery, and then you understand all its different kind of multiple multiple factors that go into its kind of branches. Um, but in a so that would be a kind of epistemology um, of blackness as understood in the kind of root model. But if you think about this from an uh, rhizomatic model, uh, what you would see then is that forms of relationality and how we can understand, for example, slavery kind of all relate to one another. So if you think about in the novel, for example, the um, migration to Sierra Leone towards the end of the novel and the relationship between slavery on the one hand and colonialism, um, that isn't a kind of <laughs> form of progression, um, but it's actually a sense of um, those two uh, different forms of oppression being entirely interconnected. So while the kind of white guy who's leading the um, emigration of black people from Nova Scotia to Sierra Leone might see that as a form of progression, um, movement towards Freetown. We understand in the novel that the, the forms of oppression that the black people experienced, um, even when they got to Sierra Leone, demonstrate the kind of web and interconnectedness between slavery and colonialism. So it's just an alternative way of understanding how we, how do we get knowledge? How do we understand that? How do we understand history? I suppose it's a representation of history as well. Um, not as a linear progression, but as a network of, of kind of multiple interconnected ideas. Okay. And so we can also understand the rhizomatic versus the root model as a way of understanding identity. So the relational identity or the root identity. And that this can be a kind of useful, <coughs> useful uh, methodology and, and kind of concept for understanding particularly post-colonial forms of identity. So Caroline Muradson in Reclaiming Difference argues over the last decade or so, some exiled post-colonial writers have explicit, explicitly reconfigured their identity by reject, rejecting the status of exile for that of migrant. So um, this is an important aspect of post-colonialism, but I think it can also be understood as an important aspect of um, African American and Black uh, North American um, experience too. So, some questions for this first half of the workshop then. So, thinking about kind of root identity and relation identity, the first question is how does Aminata's relationship with Africa develop over the course of the novel or how does it change? Um, so, Africa as being her kind of native homeland, her, part of her root identity. And the second question is, how does Lawrence Hill handle the difference between root and relation identity? And how is Lawrence Hill um, exploring those two things in the novel? So have a think about those two questions, have a look over these slides again, see if you can kind of come to an understanding yourself of the difference between root and relation or rhizomatic model and the kind of root model. And then join me for part two. <laughs>